Yesterday's lecture covered about 2400 years from the start of the first recorded Chinese dynasty, the Shang in 1500 BCE, to the end of the Tang dynasty around 900 CE. We're slowing down today, but not much. I've mentioned in two lectures now that the Tang Dynasty was officially Buddhist and that Tang rulers supported Buddhist monasteries and served as patrons of much important Buddhist art. Another very important form of art that emerges around this period is the painted scroll. This non-required work is a hand scroll, which was horizontal and meant to be unrolled and studied. Hand scrolls were usually made of silk, although as pepper paper technology improved, more would be made of paper. Like Hebrew and Arabic books, they were read from right to left. Note that this work incorporates calligraphy. The Chinese considered calligraphy to be a higher art than painting, partly because the Chinese so valued the written world, word and partly because it revealed the artist's status as a cultured and educated man. The Tang Dynasty fell in 907 CE, and for about half a century, China was splintered once again into smaller warring states. In 960, much of China was reunited under the Sung Dynasty. Despite the threat of invasion and continued military weakness, this was a vibrant time culturally for the Chinese. Scroll painting remained a very important art form, especially at the emperor's court, but the Sung Dynasty also saw the emergence of landscape painting as a dominant genre. These are not required works, but Li Cheng was considered one of the great masters of this art form. The rise of landscape painting as opposed to portrait painting may have reflected social and intellectual changes taking place in China at the time. While landowning aristocrats were still the dominant force in China, the Confucian exam system was giving rise to something of a meritocracy. Occasionally, a very bright young man of less elevated birth would rise through sheer brilliance. Successful exam candidates and Confucian scholars came to be known as the literati, and they would remain a major force in Chinese society for several hundred years. Part of what makes this work and its creator so important are the ways that Fan Quan broke with Li Cheng and other landscape painters. We don't actually know a lot about Fan Quan, but apparently he was an academy painter attached to the court who decided to live as a recluse in the countryside. Most importantly, he was a follower of Taoism. But while Fan Quan's focus on observing nature and developing his own inner life was very Taoist, he is also associated with another Chinese synthesis, in this case known as Neo-Confucianism. Yeah, this slide is long and confusing and the concepts themselves are deep and complicated, I'll be honest. Even after quite a bit of reading and research, I am not sure that I get it myself, especially the difference between portraying nature directly and portraying nature's essential Li and Qi. I would not fare well on the Chinese civil service exam. So let's try to wrap our minds around these concepts this way. I'm going to show you two required works from the 19th century, one from the U.S. and one from Mexico. Both are examples of romantic landscapes. Here's the U.S. work, an example of what's called the Hudson River School. Stay tuned. And here is a Mexican painting, a little later, but representing pretty much the same art historical period and movement. So what do these two works have in common with Fan Quan's landscape, which I'm assuming you have open in your workbooks? Well, they're both dramatic. They both include strong values, that is, contrasting shadings of light and dark, though, of course, Fan Quan's ink painting is monochromatic, and these are colored. All three even include tiny human figures, in each work portrayed as part of nature, but also fundamentally dwarfed by nature. The mule train on the bottom from Fan Quan's painting may be a group of pilgrims traveling to a Taoist or Buddhist monastery. These are often located in the mountains. But Fan Quan's painting plays with our perspective in a way that the other two, of obviously much later paintings, do not. Travelers Among Mountains and Streams is divided into three registers, and each represents a somewhat different perspective. Note how each area of light and dark occupies different spaces. They don't really connect. Fan Quan also employed distinctly different brush strokes in each of the three registers. The foreground at eye level has what one art historian calls crisp, well-defined brush strokes. The misty, large central area with the mountains is executed in a pale ink wash produced by diluting the ink with water. What are called raindrop texture strokes capture the vertical cliffs. 
the artist also uses different kinds of brush strokes to portray different kinds of trees. So while the natural world is the subject, it is not really depicted naturalistically. The painting doesn't capture nature so much as it captures a philosophy of nature. So here's one more back to the future moment. By the time we get to our whopping 27 global contemporary works, we're all going to be gasping for breath. So I've been trying to introduce some of these works earlier in the course. But why do you think I've put these two works together? What do they seem to have in common? The artist of the work on the left is Korean, not Chinese. But ink wash or literati painting was very popular in Korea as well as China. The artist quite deliberately chose to use traditional Asian ink wash methods, even though the work also reflects the influence of the 20th century abstract art. Stay tuned. Song Sunam was a leader of Korea's Sumukwa or Oriental Ink Movement in the 1980s. Sumukwa is the Korean pronunciation, I may very well be mispronouncing it, of the Chinese word for ink wash painting, also called literati painting. Think maybe the college board might ask you to draw that connection? You'll see some questions about this work on your next quiz. Meanwhile, next dynasty. The Chinese name notwithstanding, the Yuan dynasty was the first foreign dynasty to rule China, and it ruled until 1365. The first ruler of the Yuan dynasty was Kublai Khan, grandson of the famed conqueror Genghis Khan and host to Marco Polo, whose descriptions of China under Kublai Khan excited a young fellow named Christopher Columbus. The Mongols didn't have a very good rep, and for some good reasons. But Mongol rule actually brought important benefits to China. For art history, it was mostly good news, and this map tells you why. Any guesses? Basically, the Mongol Empire was divided among Genghis Khan's grandsons, but they were sufficiently united to protect traffic on the Silk Road. With trade routes secure, economic and cultural exchange flourished in this period, even if many of the literati lost their jobs and withdrew to their country homes to pout. Consider it the Pax Mongolica. Next required work. The David vases are probably the best known porcelain vases in the world because of the rare inscriptions around their necks, which date them very precisely to 1351 CE. They were named after the famous British collector who brought, bought them up in the 1920s when the Chinese Empire disintegrated and palace eunuchs started selling off imperial art. We know from the inscription that these were originally altar vases commissioned by a man named Zhang Wenjin and presented as an offering to a Taoist temple. The vases also tell, in a microcosm, the story of art and the Yuan dynasty. We now think of blue and white porcelain as quintessentially Chinese, but this aesthetic was actually an import from Iran. Remember the mirab that originally stood in an Isfahan mosque? It's from about the same period. Chinese merchants were eager to sell to this rich Iranian market, and the Mongol armies guarding the Silk Road made this possible. Iranian mines also provided the cobalt that Chinese artists needed to put the blue into their porcelain. What the Chinese brought to the exchange was porcelain technology. The technology had long existed to produce porcelain from kaolin, or fine white clay. But adding color decoration presented serious technical problems because few pigments could withstand the high temperatures needed to fire kaolin into porcelain. In the Yuan period, Chinese ceramicists discovered that ground cobalt could be mixed with water and painted on an unfired piece of porcelain. In the kiln, the blackish pigment turned a rich shade of blue. This innovation began the famous tradition of blue and white ware, which for centuries would be created for markets in China, the Muslim world, and Europe. Copper oxide was also used successfully as a decorative agent in the same way, creating the class of porcelains known as underglaze red. You see an example on the right. The imperial kilns in the Jiangxi province became the most renowned center for porcelain, not only in China, but in all the world. Here we see our old friends, the phoenix and the dragon. While the David vases were not made for the imperial household, the phoenix and dragon nevertheless traditionally represent the empress and emperor, respectively. But these two figures are also significant to Taoists. The phoenix represents the yin, or passive feminine energy, and the dragon represents the yang, or masculine active energy. Keep in mind, I'm not a Taoist. In my experience, women have plenty of active energy. At any rate, I'm going to pause here so that I don't choke YouTube. In my final lecture on Chinese art, I will talk about the Forbidden City and the formidable Chairman